Thanks, Les, and I apologize for the, the last minute arrival. You can, a little snow can make a big difference in the Burlington area in terms of driving. Um, so what I'm going to do today is talk a bit about some work that we've been doing, really looking at trying to understand both how future changes, both in the environment as well as in disturbances, are going to affect forests. But more importantly, talk a bit about, um, as someone that works as an applied scientist, thinks about not just those changes, but also how might we manage forests and sustain forests within the context of those changes. And so Les had asked me to introduce myself, but just kind of a little bit of my background. Uh, if you look at like where I got degrees, everything is forest, forest, forest. You would think that since I was six years old, I wanted to be a forester. But actual, in actuality, when I first got into forestry, it was only really luck. Um, I grew up in eastern Massachusetts, very far from any landscape like this, um, but certainly knew I loved nature and liked being outside. And just happenstance happened to apply for forestry school at University of Maine, which used to be the best forestry school in New England before UVM got their act together. Um, and when I got there, I was like, this isn't exactly what I thought it was. I just wanted to be in the woods, enjoying nature. And, and somebody years ago told me a quote that nobody gets into forestry because they like the look of a cut stump, you know. And, and really, you know, I got into forestry because I like the looks of the woods and being out in the forest. And over time, I've grown to really value and love that cut stump as well and understand that, you know, as consumers, as society that really relies on forests a lot, we need to understand both that u utilization side of it as well as that, that side of it that is just me enjoying nice natural places. And so for those of you who know we don't have a forestry program here at, at Northern Vermont University, but I advise lots of grad students. I've advised, I guess, 36 grad students in my career. Only five of them have had a forestry to undergraduate. So I advise a lot of folks that find forestry later in life, even right after their undergraduate. And also there's a lot of ways to get involved with forestry. And, and, and Les already told me the Forest Ecosystem Monitoring Cooperative is a great entity we have here in Vermont. And there's a conference at the end of, I guess, mid-December that you can go to and take a look at. So today I will talk a lot about forests. And, I, and I'm, I'm thrilled to have that as, as kind of a big part of, of what my job is I'm on the landscape. So one awesome thing about working in forests is that you do get to go to a lot of places that maybe you choose as a vacation, but also for work you get to spend places that really inspire you aesthetically, challenge you in terms of how to sustain them. So I've just kind of taken a few photos here from some places that I've enjoyed spending time. The upper left-hand corner, this is the Corum Experimental Forest, um, just south of Glacier uh, National Park, so in, in Montana. Um, in the lower left-hand corner, this is actually Ted Turner's land, the second largest landowner in the, in the country. Uh, he has a lot of forest land in the Four Corners region of New Mexico, um, Arizona, Colorado, and Wyoming. And then uh, this upper right-hand corner, I spent a lot of time in Minnesota. I was on the faculty at the University of Minnesota before moving back to New England. Very, I'm, I'm very happy to be back in New England. But one thing I do miss is there's some pretty amazing large forested peatlands, like half million acre like peat bogs um, you know, in, in northern Minnesota. So pretty inspiring places. And then again, I'm just paying homage to uh, my home state of Massachusetts. There are trees and hills, as some of you know. It's not all one big metropolitan area. And this is the Deerfield River. And so the reason I'm, I'm showing that is I hope all of us in the room can kind of agree that when we look at these, we're kind of inspired. We feel pretty good. Aesthetically, forests are, are just a fun place to spend time. Um, we even now have things called forest bathing, I guess, for, for, for human health, just as, what I used to just call a walk in the woods that we now label as kind of an activity for, for health purposes. But as our blood pressure goes down thinking about these places, when I think a little bit about just the challenges facing forests, it's pretty easy for me to get pretty stressed out about what's going to be happening in the future. And when I look at forests and kind of their, their stewardship, what we often talk about now is that we're really entering into this era of novelty, so things are happening we really don't have an analog for at all. But more importantly, there's a lot of uncertainty as to what's going to happen next in terms of future disturbances. And so I'll talk a lot about climate and drought. And so this picture here is from 2016. Hard to believe when we didn't have enough water in the landscape. But we had a pretty significant drought in, in, in the Northeast and elsewhere. So a lot of emphasis has been put on kind of future climate change. But here in the Northeast, we have the unique distinction of also having some tremendous challenges as it relates to non-native insects and diseases. And so this map on the right it's just showing the density of non-native insects and diseases per county in the U.S. And if you, if you hone in on the northeastern U.S., um, we, we by far and away exceed any other part of the country in terms of just the non-native invasive species we have. And this is just insects and diseases. And they estimate we gain one new wood-boring insect every five years to the U.S. And so just think about kind of the uncertainty associated with what's the next insect or disease that we get and how do we manage within the context of that. The reason why that's important, at least in my world, is not only because I care a lot about forests, but I care a lot about the people that are in charge of actually stewarding those ecosystems. And so a lot of my work is not just about understanding how climate change is affecting forests, but it's more importantly dealing with understanding how managers might be viewing these long-term changes and integrating that uncertainty into their management decisions. And so unlike you know, row crops where it's an annual business, if it's a bad year, you have the next year to worry about, 
With Forest, you know, you really can live with your mistakes for a lifetime and then beyond and really want to make sure you have some certainty about what you're doing in the landscape and feel good about you kind of leaving that forest in a good place going forward. And so with climate change, with invasive insects and diseases, it's created a lot of uncertainty as to how do we best manage forests now um, with all of these challenges. And so really throughout this presentation, you're going to see me talk a lot about management. And that's really because a lot of my world intersects. It's a great place to spend time with foresters around the country and particularly here in Vermont and the Northeast trying to understand how do we integrate kind of this uncertainty into what we do for stewardship on the landscape. So a couple of broad suggestions that have been brought up as to how do we manage forests and how do we sustain forests and feel okay about where they're at as it relates to climate change have revolved around just this precautionary principle of let's have just a lot of different species out there, a lot of different ages of trees, a lot of different sizes of trees. And the goal being that if we have kind of multiple ways in which that forest can respond to those changes, um, we're, we're hopeful that at least one of those species, one of those size classes is going to be able to survive and, and, and sustain themselves. So a very simple example is taking this aspen forest, at least managing it for multiple species. Maybe if there's something that affects aspen, we have other species out there that can, can, can take their place. Um, likewise, this picture on the right, having a diversity of sizes and ages of, in this pine forest, you know, maybe the, the mature trees might get affected by a disturbance, but we have these young trees to take their place if there's some sort of, some sort of disturbance event. At a landscape scale, taking you out to Colorado, um, this is a mountain pine beetle outbreak. So the, the orange crowns here, are, these are all trees that have been infested by mountain pine beetle. Um, at the landscape scale, our goal is to have what we call asynchrony. We don't want the forest to look the exact same everywhere because, because what that's giving is kind of homogeneity of vulnerability, right? So if it's all the same tree, so think of wall-to-wall -wall sugar maple in parts of, of Vermont, or wall-to-wall -wall beech, or wall-to-wall -wall spruce. Um, there's a lot of vulnerability there, and so we want to break up that landscape and have some asynchrony in how things respond. And so here, mountain pine beetle is only affecting mature trees, so these young forests, even though the exact same species are not being impacted, and likewise, these mature trees and these mixed stands are also being killed, but by having multiple species in that stand, we might still be able to sustain carbon sequestration, wood production, and all those things we care about. So kind of a pretty simplistic example of that. The other way we think about climate change, and I'll show this all in a second in, in a diagram, is that maybe we can kind of throw everything we ha have at some of these stressors and resist those changes. And so we often think about resistance approaches, so ways to manage the forest, where we're really trying to kind of anticipate what might change, but, but do the best of our ability to keep that from affecting our forests. So a pretty simple example, again, this is near uh, Lake Tahoe in, in California. So a lot of the fuel reduction treatments that happen, so thinning the forest to reduce kind of the risk of large wildfires, of course, we've been told to also rake those forests now to really reduce that risk. But really, the, the idea is that you know, if there's a fire going through there, we might not have as big a risk in that landscape. Likewise, if anybody's from Long Island or southern New, uh, New Jersey, um, the southern pine beetle is kind of a, an insect that's actually been spreading its way north. Um, so in those areas where we have infestation, removing those trees can actually kind of suppress that and resist that change. And how many folks have pulled an invasive species in their life, like out of the forest, buckthorn? A few folks have, we'll admit it. So you're trying to resist that change, right? You're, you know, at the best of your ability, trying to keep that dynamic from entering into that ecosystem. So if we look at this kind of along a gradient, there's kind of a framework that folks think of in terms of forest adaptation and different ways that we might approach managing the forest and doing things to influence that forest. And so down in this bin, the last thing I talked about um, would be a resistance approaches where we're doing the best of our ability to keep forests the way they are. You know, and from my perspective, I fell in love with the forest that I've known for you know, over, over 40 years now. And in my, I wish that we could just do this. You know, I, I wish northern hardwood forests looked like they did 10 years ago, trying to resist that change. The challenge is that we know there's a lot of impacts coming at these forests. And so we might want to actually manage at least to accept some of that change, but maybe return back to some desired conditions. And so we might move along the spectrum and, and do maybe more of a resilience approach where we're at least anticipating some change, but at least introducing some mechanisms that can respond to that. And then finally, moving all the way out here, um, one group of recommendations is why don't we start transitioning our forests now? You know, we know these changes are coming, you know, in terms of climate, in terms of invasive insects and diseases, disturbance. You know, are there things we can do to actually accommodate that change and shift those forests towards a new condition? And knowing that the, I do have a forester in the room, when we go down the spectrum, Really, you know, we have a lot of experience with managing forests now um, for the current conditions. We have some experience as well of managing forests for kind of complex structures that might be resilient, but we have so little experience. Like, how do we actually manage for future conditions? We don't have an analog for that, and it can be quite, quite a challenge. And so that uncertainty in just what to do can be quite a big, big issue. So to address this uncertainty, 
we have a lot of science going on right now trying to understand both how forests are going to change, but what I'll talk about a little bit later is how we can also look at past management to see, have things worked in the past to actually address some of these changes. So those that are familiar with looking at kind of climate change research as it relates to future forest change, a lot of the work that we often do is we want to forecast the future forest. We want to use like future climate projections, use our understanding of how different tree species respond to climate to then project how they might do across the landscape. And so one uh, major effort is called the Climate Change Tree Atlas, a great effort that's been done by the U.S. Forest Service. And what they do is they generate these maps. This happens to be for, for red pine, not a very important species here in Vermont. And what we have here is in, in yellow, this is a kind of the current distribution of that species. Then they predict kind of the future distribution. And then anything in green here is where kind of the future and past distribution match up. So it kind of shows like a reduction in suitable habitat for that species over time based on that envelope. So that's one, one thing we use for the future. Another approach is that we'll develop experiments that actually simulate the future. So this is an experiment called uh, B4 Warm. They always have great little acronyms for them. Um, this was a study in Minnesota where they warmed the atmosphere four degrees Celsius just in those plots. So you can see in the winter that those trees are still um, green. And so kind of simulating what we think might be the future and oftentimes planting trees into them and seeing how they grow. And actually in, in Vermont, we've been maintaining something at the Jericho Research Forest for a couple years now. Uh, most of you that have thought about climate change in the context of the Northeast, oftentimes it's both not enough precip some days, but often too much precip other days. And so we're trying to understand how that affects different tree species and, and their germination potential. And so we have this experiment um, where we're doing kind of a, a simulation of drought, a simulation of kind of pulsy rain events, but still sh like long drought periods, which is what we see a lot of in the, in the summer now. Um, kind of the average condition, and then, then actually with a major kind of lots more rain, which is also some of the projections for this region. And the only reason I'm showing this is just to point out we're doing similar work here as we do in other places. And again, knowing I have a forester in the room, we'll get a real kick out of the main conclusions of this. What we've also been doing is looking at whether it matters if that seed is on the litter or if the seed is on the mineral soil, so kind of the substrate of that, that forest. And I have uh, white pine and, and, and red oak here on the right, and then the different precipitation treatments. And what we've found so far is, in general, there's not a lot of sensitivity to these differences in precip. Really what matters most to some of these species is where that seed is falling, which is something we've known for over a century in forestry. But it points out that if we're imagining oak or other species migrating through the landscape, um, it needs to land on the right substrate to do that. Right? It can't just fall in leaf litter and, and, and do well. So just to, point, just to point out that we're doing some of these mesocosms. So one of the things that at least always concerns me as someone that does spend a lot of time around trees and spends a lot of time actually looking at tree rings, so here's a cross section of a, of a, a, a red spruce tree here, is that when we forecast into the future, we sometimes forget just how resilient our trees might be that are currently on the site. And so a lot of those projections, um, this is a projection of the change in red spruce abundance um, over time. What this map is not factoring in are the trees that are currently in place and the forest that's currently in place and how that might interact with some of those changes. And so it kind of often doesn't kind of fully look at that forest. And then the other issue, again, is that a lot of the experiments that we're now doing with these mesocosm studies are just small seedlings. We grow them for three years and then we draw grand conclusions over the future of the forest from the growth of a three-year tree. And that'd be similar to us kind of watching like a six-month-old to a one-year-old and kind of viewing that's the future of the human race in terms of how that thing operates. There's a lot of difference between what a seedling does relative to an average-sized average tree relative to a large tree. And so what I'm going to get into is talking a little bit about how we're trying to better understand the forests that currently are there in the landscape, how those are changing, what's that telling us, and then what we can learn maybe by looking in the past at how they responded um, to past changes. So, I'm going to discuss some work that's been going on, and, and Jane Foster, who's a, a scientist that I get to work with and, and take, I get to latch my name to all of her great work that she's doing, that's been looking at kind of what's been happening in the region as it relates to kind of the, the location of that ecotone boundary, so the, the boundary between the northern hardwood forest and the spruce fir forest. And all of you are fortunate enough to get to look at this every day on this campus. You can see it starkly from um, Johnson, you know, looking back at Smuggler's Notch and that, that region or any mountain in Vermont. And so, just to orient ourselves, so we generally have this certain, you know, northern hardwood, maple forest, and then um, you know, we transition this ecotone into spruce fir forest um, at higher elevations. And so a lot of the projections have been that you know, with climate change, we would expect those more cold adapted species like balsam fir and to a lesser degree red spruce to migrate upslope, and we're going to see you know, hardwood forest migrate upslope as well. And there's actually been some pretty, um, you know, some recent some published papers that have, that have said this is happening even in Vermont. 
So we were interested in actually seeing, is this really happening, you know, and can we tell from the past if there's been any movement in this ecotone boundary? And so what we've been using is Landsat imagery, so satellite imagery, so images of the Earth's surface. Um, folks are familiar with aspects of this, so there's a unique reflectance of light off of the Earth's surface that can tell us, you know, different characteristics of the vegetation, snow, and so forth. And what we did, what we sampled within the Green Mountains and the White Mountains, um, all the areas that kind of fell within that ecotone, so kind of this unique elevational band uh, in the region. And then looked, you know, in this case starting in 1991, what has been the location and movement of the edge between kind of hardwoods and conifers over time. And what we found is that in general, this is just showing the elevation of that ecotone, many things didn't move much at all, but in general we actually saw more of a downslope migration um, relative to an upslope migration of, of trees. Right? If we look at that just between the two states, so green mountains versus white mountains, these violin graphs, so this is the upper elevation and the lower elevation of the, that ecotone. Um, for both of those over time, we can see that's, that's shifting down slope. And in particular, when we use spring imagery, so instead of using imagery that in the fall when there's still leaves on the trees, if we look at kind of this forest in the spring, when we can actually see the understory, we really saw this pronounced downward migration, which again, those of us that think about how forests work, that's how it would occur, right? It would be through the understory as, as, as trees are moving down slope. So those that are, are, are puzzled by this, we decided, well, let's take this a bit further and look at kind of a wider area in the, the Northeast. And, and those that haven't been exposed to it yet, the Google Earth Engine is an amazing kind of large cloud-based server that allows you to look at tons and tons of data, and, and including like tons and tons of satellite imagery to look at, at pretty, pretty pr um, detailed areas. Um, and process them, process them quite, quite rapidly. And so we decided to sample in the Northeast, things like the Adirondacks, um, the Green Mountains, all the way up into Northern Maine. And the green area is what Charlie Cogbill and Peter White predicted where spruce fir would, would exist. And then what we looked at were, if we zoom in on these areas, um, anything that was stayed green was conifer at the beginning of the period, stayed conifer at the beginning of the period. Anything that changes red is actually increasing in conifer. Anything that stays black is, is staying as deciduous forest. So if I zoom into, this part of the world, uh, just south, so, so kind of here, here up in Stowe, kind of north of here. So in this region, what we're seeing, and those that spent time in the woods here, you're actually seeing like conifers going down slope. In most places, we're, we're seeing actually a shift down slope, an increase in conifer trend. Not to leave out the Great Smoky Mountain National Park or West Virginia, where we also have quite a bit of uh, spruce fir. Same trend, see the red there? So again, they're gaining spruce and fir, they're not losing it. Um, likewise, in the Smokies, more stable, um, but, but generally gaining it. And the Smokies, just in terms of changes in climate, so looking down here, those that have maybe seen changes in climate in the, in the U.S. over the past 20 years, a lot of folks have called this area a warming hole, so they're not seeing kind of that, that rapid warming other places have seen uh, over the past 20 years or so. So we'll be curious, as the Smokies start to warm a bit more, do we, the, the spruce and fir still stay happy down there? But again, um, we're seeing this change. And one final point uh, along these lines, the, the way that this works, again, is so we can zoom in on any area. This happens to be White, Fa White Face Mountain in the Adirondacks, a mountain that some of you might be familiar with, either hiking or at least um, seen uh, going across the ferry or in Burlington. We can zoom in on a single pixel and see how that's changed over time. So this is just showing uh, you know, the green being conifer, the red being areas that gain conifer, and the black being deciduous areas. And what's neat is that you can look at kind of what has been the spectral signal, kind of the reflectance signal off of that spot on the ground over the past 30 years, kind of what, how's light been reflected? In this case, we're using a normalized uh, wetness index, so the wetter the foliage, the more evergreen that foliage is, just an index of, of how coniferous it is. This is, and this is one spot on the ground. And what we see is that these forests are transitioning from deciduous to evergreen over time, right? We're seeing a, a gain, right? Totally counter to every projection that we've seen for this region. Everybody's like spruce and fir, they're in big trouble. So what's going on, again, I know some of the room already have in the back of the head, they know, they know what's going on. What we're seeing is that this is recovery from land use. You know, thinking about the history of a lot of our landscape here, um, before we had certainly roads or railway to move heavy sinking hardwoods around, um, rivers were the primary thing we moved, uh, way we moved things around, and in particular red spruce was a highly coveted species. And so, what would happen is folks would kind of cut up the slope and then, then basically unmix that ecotone, pick out the red spruce from a lot of these areas. And this is a picture uh, of the Connecticut River down near Bellows Falls, a great book on the log drives in the Connecticut, 1912. You could walk across that river on logs. That's all red spruce that you're looking at there. And so basically we've kind of lost a lot of that seed source and we're just starting to see recoveries. So anywhere in the woods you see 
and I've, I ski at Smuggler's yeah. Notch. I always look at it as I go up, this, up the, the, the slope. There's a mature red spruce. Now I'm starting to see lots of young red spruce around it recovering from that land use. Anybody here from Massachusetts? What, do anybody know the city name Paper City in Massachusetts? You know what cities nicknamed that, Paper City? Holyoke, right? There's no red spruce around Holyoke, Mass. They were, they were taking logs from northern New England and, and sending them down to rivers all over the place. So this legacy of land use has really impacted things. The other element that's really critical is that the Clean Air Act was quite successful in many regards, and in particular in terms of the health of red spruce, a very sensitive species to atmospheric deposition. And so not only are we seeing this recovery from land use, and so now we're starting to get seed sources back in the landscape, but we're also seeing kind of greater health in our, in our, our red spruce now because of the Clean Air Act, at least for now. And then also, I can't belittle that, you know, we've had things like um, beech bark disease, you know, decline in paper birch, a lot of things going on in that hardwood ecotone that they're, they're stressed, and so now we're starting to see um, possibly some some impact in terms of um, you know, spruce being able to do better in that landscape. So the point being, as we think about future change, you know, there's a lot of recovery and dynamics going on in our landscape right now that may actually give us counter projections and maybe speak to the value of understanding how forests are changing currently um, versus just moving on to the future. So we're not the only ones to see this, and there's been a lot of work kind of showing that even though we have seen you know, tremendous shifts in, in temperature, precipitation, over the past 50 years in this region, um, trees are pretty amazing, but they cannot move at, at super fast rates, right? So the migration of some of those trees to track that um, change has been quite, quite slow. And so we have failure to migrate, the extinction of debt, the colonization. These are all associated with, you know, we, we, the tree species are not able to move as quickly to track that. And so when we think about the future functioning of our forests, like, like Mount Hunger here, and, and kind of how that's going to be influenced over the next 100 years or so, you know, there's a lot that be, can be gained by looking at what's currently there, right? It's really going to be a, a dr primary driver of what's happening on that, on that landscape. So what I'm going to segue into is we do a lot of work with looking backwards in the forest. And I should have brought a few examples, but we do a lot of work with dendrochronology. So coring trees, looking at the tree rings, and reconstructing back in time kind of how forests have developed, even from dead logs. This is a, a log from a a white pine that got blown over in the 1938 hurricane still has solid, solid heartwood in that, so pretty, pretty impressive. But what we really want to do is if we know some of these species are going to be present in the landscape even over the next 100 years, can we learn something about what really influences their growth as it relates to climate, population structure, and also what I'll get into is are there things that we can do from a management standpoint that actually influence the ability of these species to respond to climate and, and, and those stressors over time. So traditionally, when folks would look at the influence of climate on tree growth in a forest, the way they would sample that would be in a pretty biased way. Right? So if I were just looking at this and I really wanted to look at climate influence on tree growth, I'd try to find the oldest trees in the forest and, and use those and often trees that aren't experiencing any competition. But all of us appreciate these are kind of a biased sample. Right? There's not many individuals like that in the forest. And so what I'm going to be not going to go into much of the details as I go through this, but we core a lot of trees and we core all of the trees, right, that are, well, we have some mercy. We core trees down to about this big, right, and not on plots that you want veneer off of. So um, we're, we're generally, you know, trying to get the population signal to that climate, not just an individual tree that this really awesome old hemlock. That's only one individual. We want to know kind of how is that whole population responding. So we core all those trees. So don't respond to our inquiries for field technicians. There's a lot of, lot of, lot of uh, elbow grease all, all summer. So as an example, before I left Minnesota, we had the opportunity uh, to, to sample a, a large area. Anybody from the Lake States region in the room? Anybody spend time out there? All right, cool. So awesome place to, to, to work, uh, particularly as it relates to, relates to climate, because this is the edge of the eastern forest here. So a lot of kind of dynamics going on there in terms of climate change and so forth. And we went into this portion of the Superior National Forest and intensively cored a ton of plots. And the goal was really to understand kind of how have trees been responding to climate um, in this landscape. And then what we wanted to do is understand how did climate you know, influence their growth historically, and is that something we should you know, try to understand as we, as we go forward? Well, what we did was we tried to predict growth um, of these trees, and we included in our model things like the size of the tree, the age of the tree, and then a bunch of, bunch of uh, climate variables. And again, uh, anybody that's ever tried to understand how well a tree is going to grow in the future, usually the best thing to predict tree growth is size, right? And so what we found in any given year, over 90% of that tree's growth could be explained by the size of the tree. Nothing to do with climate at all, right? And again, this is not a shocker to a couple people in the room, and it wasn't even, that, that that really mattered more than anything else. 
And then when we did look at climate, yes, there was, there was certainly some importance, like 4% of the variation was explained by things like um, you know, the level of drought. So this is just a, the ratio of precipitation to evapotranspiration, just so kind of the, the level of kind of moisture stress in that population. But overall, what we found was that you know, just knowing the size structure of that forest was, was more important than understanding climate. Taking it a step further, and I, I can take a second to, to go through this, what we also did was look at kind of the within species variation in response to climate. And so what we're looking at here is starting with PIMA all the way down to ACRU. These are just the four letter acronyms for different species. So PIMA is Picea mariana, black spruce, we have white spruce, paper birch, larch, trembling aspen, jack pine, balsam fir, northern white cedar, red pine, black ash, white, white pine, big tooth aspen, sugar maple, red oak, and red maple. And what we wanted to do was understand all these trees were in the populations we were sampling. We wanted to look at, well, within a species, what was the range of variation in response to climate? And in this case, we're looking at the range of variation in response to temperature. And what we found was that there was actually more variation within a species than between species in terms of their variability in climate. And so oftentimes when we talk about like the future of the, the northern forest, a lot of folks say, well, red oak's a winner and balsam fir is a loser. But there's a lot of variation within that, depending on kind of the size of the species, the age of the species, and so forth. And when we actually looked at kind of what best explained the species like, you know, trembling aspen, larch, with really wide ranges of responses to temperature, we looked at their distribution kind of across North America. And so each of these dots here represents the centroid of the, 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 the geographic range of those species. And what we found is that the best predictor of that variation was actually the longitudinal range. So species that had very wide east-west distributions had much more plasticity in their climate response than ones that had kind of, kind of narrow east-west distributions. And again, my point about the, the lake states, it makes sense because if you, if you are a species that can exist all the way from, you know, let's just say New Brunswick or Nova Scotia all the way to Canada, all the way to Western Canada and British Columbia, there's tremendous moisture gradients that you can, you can deal with across that range. And so we saw a really, really wide range of, of variability in that. And so this finding really made at least some of us feel okay, this, a nugget of, of positivity about the future, in that there's a lot of resilience in just individual species in general to response to climate. That really varies as a function of their size, their age, the structure of that forest. And so this notion that you know, because it's a red maple it's going to win and because it's a balsam fir it's going to lose, there's a lot of variability both with, within a site but even between sites in terms of what we're going to see. And what this also talked a lot about with us is that, you know, let's just not look at individual trees grown in a warming experiment. If we look at the entire forest and sample all of the species and all of the size classes in there, we can see that there's a lot more complexity in how forests are going to respond to change than just what a model might, might show. But, of course, that's useful. Those are, those are natural stands. But what we want to do is take us a step further and try to understand what does this tell us about management? Can we actually you know, use management experiments as a way to kind of look in the past and understand, is there evidence that certain approaches to kind of addressing climate change have proven effective in the past? And, and, and the reason I, it's critical, particularly in forest management, is that this forester here or there is not you know, planning just for the next two years. They're planning for the next 20, next 50, next 100. And so, to make a decision based on not a lot of confidence is, is, is a pretty risky proposition. So we want to understand, can we at least prove that there's been some ways for managing forests in the past that show some validity as it relates to kind of future, future response. So one of the things that we really focused in on, and actually Jonathan seen me talk a little bit about this before, is there's a lot of interest as we think about moisture stress, drought events, um, kind of how that might affect forests both in the west but also here in the northeast and trying to understand are there ways we can manage forests to minimize the impacts of droughts, right? And, and when we minimize the impact of drought, we also are minimizing the impacts of insects and diseases, minimizing the impacts of fire. We have the goal being to kind of reduce the density of this forest, this is already a thin stand here, so that we're increasing the level of resources available to the trees left in that stand. So they have the ability to, to withstand some of these stressors. Um, this is definitely kind of a, a resistance strategy, trying to manage to keep the forest as is. It's kind of a near-term solution to maybe long-term transition to other, other strategies on that site. So to do that, I mentioned we like to core lots of trees in various places. And we were able to take advantage of an amazing invest, investment that began in the 19-teens by the U.S. Forest Service and what's known as the U.S. Forest Service Experimental Forest. And I'm only showing eight examples, but these exist really in any state that has forests in it across the U.S. Um, although we don't, have, we don't have one in, in Vermont, uh, but we, we certainly have a long-term forest service experiment station here. So 
the Fort Valley Experimental Forest, this is near Flagstaff, Arizona, the oldest, the first um, established, I believe in 1914 or 1918, I forget, forget which of those two, but very, very old forest. Um, there's ones in the Black Hills, Minnesota has a couple, Argonne in, in Wisconsin, Vinton Furnace in Ohio, um, the Bartlett Experimental Forest in New Hampshire, the Penobscot Experimental Forest in Maine. The unique thing about all of these is not only are they like places where they've been doing experiments, they also know the detailed history of how these forests have been managed for a long time. So we can go into those areas and sample these forests. So if I go into this stand here at Fort Valley and I collect tree rings from those trees, I can look at the growth of that tree over time, but I also know how that forest has been managed. So I can see does the growth of that tree differ from a forest that was managed a different way? So kind of, kind of compare those differences across the landscape. So bringing it to uh, New England, uh, one of the droughts that we've looked at in the past is the 2001 drought. I know it predates many of you, but the 2001 drought uh, was a very severe drought uh, by, by northeastern standards, um, quite hot and quite dry. Um, and, and what we do is look at these known drought events and evaluate, do we see differences in how that forest responded to that drought depending on how it was managed, okay? So this is from central Maine near Bradley, Maine, Penobscot Experimental Forest, so a spruce fir forest. And this y-axis is kind of a, a measure of the resistance of that forest to the drought. So um, did we see a major change in that forest, both in terms of its growth and mortality? And so values below one would suggest that forest grew poorly and had more mortality during the drought than values above one. And then this is arrayed as a function of the density of that forest, kind of the percentage of the maximum kind of stocking one we might see. So as we increase the density of that forest, it's not the strongest relationship in the world, but we generally see this kind of curvilinear increase that there's less resistance as that forest gets dense, right? So the more trees out there, kind of lower resistance um, to that event. Taking it to a part of the world where drought really makes the news, uh, you know, relative to what we see, we want to look at this in particular across uh, Ponderosa pine and red pine using the Fort Valley Experimental Forest, the Black Hills Experimental Forest, and the Cutfoot on, on, in Minnesota to really look at this, this tremendous gradient in aridity. So I, whenever I go to this part of the world in the southwest, I can't believe they can even grow trees in terms of what they get for precipitation. But even, when, even moving to Minnesota, a much drier environment than what we have here in the northeast. This is, this is, a, this is a rainforest compared to um, the lake states. So we wanted to evaluate how have these forests responded to drought um, and responded to Kind of this increase in density. So this is just the three different locations, Minnesota, South Dakota, Arizona, um, and this, this y-axis again is a measure of either the, is the resilience to those droughts. So values above one suggest that that forest was able to withstand the drought and actually grow fine through that drought and recover. Values below one suggest a negative impact. And this is arrayed again as a function of density. So as I go this way, the forest gets denser, like more trees in the forest. So pretty strong negative relationship as that forest gets denser its ability to withstand drought goes lower, which suggests to me that we can manipulate that density and influence kind of how forests respond to drought over time. If I translate this to kind of some of the tools we often use for drought, this is just a diagram of what we call a stocking guide. Again, familiar to some folks, although this is a metric. Um, what we tend to find when we look at the results of all these studies is that forests that are grown kind of at these high density conditions, it's no surprise, tend to be pretty vulnerable because there's a lot of competition but also forests that are grown at very low density conditions tend to be very vulnerable to drought. Why, why would a forest with very few trees in it be vulnerable to drought? Any have thoughts on that? Hi, I'm Sarah. Hey, Sarah. Uh, I have to wonder uh, just overall about the amount of litter that's there on the ground that can help keep that moisture in. As people know, if you mulch your garden, your garden's gonna be thriftier and grow better. And so uh, even if you've got pines, you're still gonna have every couple of years and losing needles and that eventually becomes mulch. And that helps so reduced trees, less mulch. Yeah, so the potential for maybe the litter, litter dynamics are a little bit different out there, absolutely. I'm Caitlin. Hey, Caitlin. Um, I know that there are trees, there are roots, they help them connect and talk to each other, basically. So maybe there's less communication between the trees because there are less trees. Yes, yeah, so you might have kind of less mycorrhizal associations and kind of the ability for the trees to deal with that stress. What else? So it's very open. So if you're going to go get out of the sun on a on a hot day, you're going to a forest with a couple of scattered trees or a forest with, that's like wall-to-wall -wall trees, wall-to-wall -wall trees, right? So what happens during a drought in these very open stands is the, is the sun's hitting the ground and actually evaporating a lot of moisture as well. So not only are the trees very large, they have very large crowns, which is very hard for them to deal with when all of a sudden there's a shock of a drought, but also there's a lot of moisture loss happening. There's not that mulching from, from, the, from the soil because the sun's hitting the soil and creating that. So it um, can also be a big issue. 
The point being, actually, most of how we manage forests to begin with is pretty good in terms of minimizing drought impacts if we were to thin them. One last comment on that is because we know the history of these forests, we've been able to go into these areas and look at within the same species, so this happens to be all red pine, and, and those that have had a, maybe haven't thought about density much, so going from a low density all the way to a very high density, right, so very different management histories. All these trees are the exact same age. All these trees are growing in the exact same spot. The only thing that differs is that for the past 50 years, the trees in this forest have been maintained at a very low density. The trees in this forest have been maintained at a very high density. And so when we looked at how does climate influence growth of these species, what we found is that within a species, depending on the density of the forest, these trees only really respond to fall temperatures. If there's a, if there's a high fall temperature the year prior, they don't grow as well in the current year because they use a lot of stored carbohydrates. Whereas as we increase density, not only does fall temperature matter, but also precipitation. And so what this shows is that even within a species, we can affect its response to climate depending on how we manage it. And so translating that to what we do out in the forest, it says if we have complexity in size and density, we have complexity in climate response, right? So having kind of that, that variety in density and variety in size can actually influence um, what's happening out there on the landscape. All right. So we've been talking a lot about kind of looking backwards. And what I'm going to do is kind of finish talking about some work that we're doing to try to look forward. You know, really, really, can we develop some new experiments, develop some new ways to test some of these strategies, in particular, start testing some of those ones where we have the greatest uncertainty, these transition approaches where we don't have a lot of familiarity with kind of managing for, for future forest conditions. And so I'll talk a little bit about those transition approaches. So again, just to remind you, a lot of what we've been discussing so far, you know, thinning's kind of a resistance strategy. It also can kind of build in some resilience, you know, the ability of that forest to recover. But we haven't really got into kind of, are there ways to actually manage forests where we're deliberately transitioning aspects of that forest into kind of future conditions that may or may not um, respond positively to those changes. So we've been fortunate enough uh, at the University of Vermont uh, to be part of what's known as the Adaptive Silviculture for Climate Change Network. And this is a a map of all the locations that exist for that. And the one I'm going to talk about today is the Second College Grant in northern New Hampshire, um, Dartmouth property. Anybody in here ever been to the Second College Grant besides John? It's just a, it's a slice of paradise. You know, it's a really awesome part of, of New England. Um, not that this isn't either, but the Northeast Kingdom over to Western Maine to me is kind of my, my place. And what's unique about this, you see the term up there, co-produced or co-development. Um, in the scientific community, there's a lot of movement, especially as it relates to climate change and other challenges, to move away from what the historic approach to things was, which was me sitting in my office coming up with what I think is a good idea, and then 10 years later trying to shop it to people and thinking it's useful to them, right? And instead, at the very beginning of the experiment, bringing managers in at the beginning and talking to them about how would you address this, what are some of the questions you might want to ask, really co-producing that science with stakeholders and managers so that what we're generating from that science actually might have some useful you know, application right away versus you know, hoping that somebody finds a use for it down the road. So co-production, that's what that term means. And I showed a map earlier of those experimental forests and that investment that the U.S. Forest Service started in the 19 teens. And what the Forest Service was interested in doing was now developing a new series of experiments that can start testing some of the challenges we're dealing with now. So can we kind of develop a new wave of studies that do two things? One, include managers in the design, but two, make those studies large enough so that they actually accommodate, you know, operational, you know, nuance. So when there's a skitter out there, how does that affect things and so forth? So these aren't just tiny little plots the size of this room. So the area that I've been working with, again, uh, those not familiar with where uh, Second College Grant is, the history of that property, you know, this has been managed by Dartmouth since 1807. Um, it was the second grant they got from the state of New Hampshire, the first one they sold, on um, the second one they retained. Um, and it's 27,000 acres, so a very large chunk of land. Dartmouth owns a third of all of the school forest land in the Northeast. They have a very large uh, amount of, of forest holdings and do a tremendous job um, stewarding that. So we were fortunate enough to partner with them when we were looking for a large spot for an experiment um, to be able to put this in. And so um, here's the second college grant in Northern Coas County. Um, and what we did was kind of replicate this as a very large scale. Um, it's over 400 acres in size, this experiment itself. So it's a, it's a small drop in the bucket for their for their, their ownership, but, but pretty large for what we do um, in, in the Northeast. And so what we were really interested in doing was focusing in on northern hardwood forests. And in 2016, we had a group of folks, um, both managers, wildlife biologists, fisheries biologists, hydrologists, 
um, scientists all get together um, in a cabinet and design the study. Kind of what, what would folks want to see on this landscape? What are the vulnerabilities to this forest? And how do we manage in the face of that vulnerability um, going forward? And so I'm going to go through kind of how this works, but essentially what was done is we have these broad categories. We want to resist change. We want to build in resilience to change. We want to have transition in response to change. And so the idea was, how do we actually operationalize that locally? You know, how would you manage this forest today for resistance? How would you manage this forest for resilience and so forth and so on? So we're going to go through kind of each of those, those treatments. Um, these are all replicated four times in 25 acre units. So they're large, you know, experimental units so we can pick up on um, wildlife responses and other things. And so for resistance, and I apologize, only one person probably annoyed this is a metric. It's a 70 to 90 square feet per acre. Um, what resistance was focused on doing was keeping these forests as sugar maple dominated forests with uneven age structure. So using single tree selection, these are actually good soils for, for New Hampshire. Um, increasing the amount of dead wood. I'm um, trying to favor species that or individuals that might be resistant to beech bark disease, ice resistant stems and so forth. And so one of the things we did, we were reducing the density doing single tree selection. So trying to increase the resources available um, to those trees. Um, as I mentioned, when they were marking trees to retain, if we found a beach that it was smooth barked, retaining that because it was showing resistance to be beach bark disease. If we saw a crown form like this, this nice U-shaped crown form, you know, that's resistance to ice damage, right? When we have a, a V-shaped crown form, it's much more re uh, vulnerable to ice damage. So trying to favor individual tree forms that are resistant. And then a big part of this experiment was trying to increase the amount of dead wood in the forest. So I call it mortic morticulture instead of silviculture, kind of managing dead, dead, dead elements. And part of this was, as, as I've mentioned already, and as many of you already know from, from living in this region, um, there's a lot of concern over these episodic kind of pulsy rain events. And so trying to increase the amount of dead wood in the forest is a way to minimize some of those hydrologic impacts so, but, and resist those change. Moving into resilience, um, again, I'm not going to give you a quiz on silviculture terminology. Just trust me, these are silvicultural techniques we're using here. But the goal there was to start introducing multiple ways for that forest to respond to disturbance. So not just having sugar maple dominance, but can we introduce multiple cohorts? Can we introduce a diversity of species? And so using uh, you know, group selection, so creating canopy gaps, having multiple ways in which that forest can respond compositionally, structurally. And then again, trying to get things like yellow birch, red maple, red spruce, kind of recruiting in that stand that we at least had some sense for might be future adapted. So creating those openings, creating those conditions that might actually uh, allow those species to respond. And then finally, transition. Um, again, still working with the current forest there, but instead of using kind of this mosaic of uneven age conditions, starting to create larger gaps in that forest, while at the same time maintaining some structure. And really, this is a panoramic shot of what these treatments look like. Having this heterogeneity from kind of deep shade to opening to thin matrix to opening, where we have multiple ways for that forest to, to, to recruit tree species, and also, as I'll mention in a little bit, uh, multiple ways to actually introduce some species into that forest that aren't currently there or are there at a very low abundance. So, yeah, so that's, that's what's going on there. So planting, planting some species that we are, have been projected to be future adapted, as well as retaining some species that, are, that we feel have high wildlife value or future, future function. So what does that look like through the eyes of, of some high resolution LIDAR? Um, what you're looking at here, this, the, the hotter the color, kind of the higher the canopy. So this is just a portion of that experiment. Uh, so this is the resistance after it was cut. So you can just see kind of the light um, you know, change in that color. So single tree selection. This is resilience. So you're starting to see some blue, which is the ground. So there's some kind of finer scale gaps. And then this is transition. So you're seeing a bit, little bit, a bit, bit, bit larger openings. And what you're looking at here is just a slice of kind of one of the upper blocks of this experiment. Um, so there's a lot of work going on there with just high resolution LIDAR and trying to detect canopy height and how that's affected over time. So, but certainly a lot of heterogeneity being created on that landscape. So future adapted species and planting. So as I mentioned, the transition is trying to manage for future conditions in the landscape. And so what we did, it's a, it's a blip in the bucket for our operational planting crew, but a lot of seed, it felt like a lot of seedlings to us, but it's not that many. Um, we planted 6,500 um, bare root seedlings um, in the study. We only planted in those large gaps. So if I go back a slide, we can see a close-up of that. Um, we were only planting in these large openings. We weren't planting everywhere, just in those areas where it made sense from a kind of resource, resource perspective to, to plant. Um, the species that we selected, uh, we used certainly the future projected changes for parts of our choices. So this is um, what they're supposed to do over the next 100 years based on the climate change tree atlas for northern uh, New Hampshire. 
So many of these, like bitternut hickory, black birch, black cherry, red oak, are supposed to gain habitat in this region. Some are already there, like red oak. Others, like bitternut hickory, are not currently in that part of the region. Other species, like white pine, big tooth aspen, they're supposed to kind of retain that habitat. There's not going to be a change, positive or negative, just neutral. Um, American chestnut, we planted B3, F3 crosses. So these are um, trees that have been bred for resistance to uh, chestnut blight. So those are also supposed to do a <laughs> no problem. And then uh, everybody loves chestnut. And then um, we planted two species that go counter to projections. So eastern hemlock, what's the, what's the problem with planting hemlock? Your thoughts Isn't it really adelgid? Yeah, hemlock really adelgid. <laughs> and then I've talked already a bit about red spruce. Um, people think it's supposed to decline. As you can tell from my previous, we, we have some pretty good confidence that red spruce, especially in this part of New England, it is, it is that, it, kind of the western extent of that maritime forest. It's very wet, very snowy. And in terms of hemlock, um, there's been some projections in terms of future climate that that might actually be a refugial region for hemlock away from adelgid based on temperature. So we felt like we wanted that out there, particularly if balsam fir is going to be lost from the landscape. We wanted to have some other long-lived conifers out there. So how are things doing? So we've been do following this for a couple of years now. People want to know um, how many seedlings have we killed so far. Uh, so what I've done here is I've, I've ordered things based on survival, kind of from highest survival down to lowest survival. And I've categorized things based on what we call the forest assisted migration type. So kind of how we've, wh what have we been doing out there? And so E just means enrichment planting. So we just took a species that was already currently in that landscape and increased its representation. So it's not like I'm moving that from outside of its range. Um, and then PE means this is a population expansion. I've actually taken that species or that resistant genotype and moved it into an area that it wasn't currently prior to us doing it, right? So kind of, um, unless it, you know, it could have been in somebody's front yard, but not really in the forest. And what we generally see is first, kind of our overall survival is not fantastic, primarily because several of these species are doing very poorly. Um, but the ones that are doing best so far, you know, I didn't even have to do the study, red oak, you know, is doing quite well um, early on. Red spruce as well. So we have two species with two very different projections. Red oak's supposed to increase, red spruce is supposed to decrease. Both of them right now are doing quite well. And what this speaks to is that there's a lot of risk in planting based on changes over the last number of years. Yeah, question. Um, as far as this goes, the, the data from this, sorry, my name's Alex. Um, yeah, it's does this take into account what the average survival has been noted in like previous years and in other places as well too, or is this just, just specifically in this? So that's a great point. I did not include it, but we planted this so two Mays ago. This May, I was so jealous. It would have been the best year to plant this year. I mean, it, it just, whatever, I could have put a dead stick in the ground. I think it would have survived um, or come back to life. Last May, those that maybe remember it or were here, it was brutal. It was, you know, it got to be 90 degrees. It was windy, the worst conditions, and that's the worst conditions possible to plant. And I watched the weather every day after these trees went in the ground, like, please, you know, rain, rain, rain. And we were lucky enough to get rain, you know, basically about an inch or so of rain over a week after these got planted. We then planted in Wolcott, Vermont, and Washington, Vermont, same species. They did not receive a significant rainfall, same, same period, for almost three weeks. The survival at those sites, extremely low. And so um, what that speaks to are two things. One, with this kind of global weirding we're dealing with in terms of climate conditions, what normally is the best time of year to plant, there's going to be years now that it's just bizarre weather. But also, even within that season, if you get things in the ground at the right time, you, know, you, you can do really well. But if you, if you all happen to hit that, we're getting a lot of these stretches now for two weeks we don't get rain and we get a ton of it, you know, and so those can be pretty critical for seedling survival. The order is still pretty similar, but the, the overall survival is a bit, bit lower. Um, and one species I've grown to really appreciate through this work is bitternut hickory can really, can come back from the dead. When you put it in the ground, it looks terrible, but it's got a really big rootstock. And so we saw a lot that looked really bad early on. They re-sprouted and we were able to survive. So some of these species can deal with it um, quite effectively. Um, but in general, there's a lot of risk, you know, the further we go down and also, um, the quality of the planting stock. We don't have a lot of nurseries around here to produce seedlings, so you, know, you have a lot of challenges even getting the source material um, for this. But, but great, great question. All right. So even though we've seen a lot of, of mortality in some cases, if I look at the regeneration happening across all these forests, so I have control, resistance, resilience, and this is just kind of the average drought tolerance of what's coming back in that forest. What we've done by introducing some of these species into the forest is that we now have kind of a wider range of re functional traits in that system that weren't there prior to that experiment. And so I'm not talking about, and I'm not a fan of, like we're just going to wholesale shift and re-engineer the forest. But by introducing some of these species, some of these genotypes, 
is providing at least multiple pathways for that forest to recover from that weren't there, you know, prior to at least manipulating that, that landscape. And, uh, and then to drive that point home, actually, I just like looking at LIDAR images, it's kind of cool. Um, none of our treatments are like clear cut the forest and plant the new forest, right? We, and as I mentioned already, I have a lot of faith in the ability of the trees that are currently there that are only 80 to 90 year old sugar maple to really withstand a lot of these disturbances and changes. And so what we're trying to do is work within the constraints of the current system to introduce multiple pathways, either natural mechanisms or by, in some cases, getting source populations established that maybe in 100 years will be an important seed source for that region um, as things continue to change and shift across that landscape. And so still managing the forest for complex structures, complex species diversity, um, you know, is, is valid today as it was 20 years ago. But now what we're looking at is can we introduce some of these species in places as a way to at least enhance the capacity of that system or not. All right. So with that said, um, there is a lot of need for kind of recalibrating what we do in the landscape, but at least I take comfort in the fact that there's a lot of evidence that suggests how we've been doing things with a few minor tweaks actually can work quite well, even in current, current context. You know, that, that managing for multiple species, thinning the forest, managing for complexity, you know, there's a lot of value for that today as there was when we were talking about it in the context of ecosystem management. But when we're getting into trying to understand how these species change, um, I do get very concerned, I've mentioned it already, with this notion that this species is a climate change winner, this species is a climate change loser. There's so much variation, even in Vermont, you know, sugar maple, it exists on so many different sites. If I'm on a north-facing face, slope with deep soils, it's going to do well no matter on that site for a long time. If I'm on a south-facing slope, shallower soils, I might be a little bit concerned on those areas. And so there's a lot of risk in kind of giving up on species, not thinking about how do we manage with those and have heterogeneity. At the same time, as I mentioned, we're not seeing this pace of migration that's keeping track with these shifts. And so things like red oak that we're actually seeing a lot more regeneration of in places already um, might make sense where we can encouraging those species, sustaining those seed sources, and trying to bring some of those multiple climate responses on the landscape um, can be quite critical. So um, a lot of people contribute to this work. Uh, in particular, I want to acknowledge the Northern Research Station from the Forest Service, um, who for over a century now has been in investing kind of all of our tax dollars into these long-term studies that are, that are tremendously valuable for us, um, as well as obviously the University of Vermont and uh, Dartmouth College Woodlands, um, who do a lot of work in supporting this experiment and have been, been tremendous partners on that, on that study. And I will finish with a, a view from a place I'm not excited about sugar maple, Groton State Forest, where, yeah, it'd be hard to grow. Be, I'm, I'm worried about the future on that site, but that's just because it's a granite, granite soil and not, not the place I grew up. But I have plenty of time for questions if folks want to ask and throw, throw tomatoes, whatever makes the most sense. sense. Yeah. Yeah, that's, I mean, I think one of the bigger challenges are these extreme events, and it seems like almost to the calendar, Halloween, get ready every year, there's going to be something strange uh, besides costumes and hijinks. Uh, you know, the, there's been a pretty significant strange, at least since I've moved, I've, I've been back in this region for five years now, there's, every Halloween's had something. Um, and so in those cases, you know, there's, there's two things, you know, one is that we have to accept that those dynamics are part of our forest, and, and they always have been, and even kind of that forest then progressively, you know, blowing down further. That's, you know, when we would have a gap in the forest historically, you know, that would just be the initial disturbance and things would then over time shift and, and, and kind of build off of that, whether it was because of more wind, uh, bark beetles, you know, root disease. But if the goal is to sustain the functioning of that mature, you know, forest that, that then blew over and minimize kind of how dramatic that change is, um, one suggestion, I guess there's two suggestions, one, from a resistance perspective, you know, when you thin, you do influence wind firmness of those trees and influence kind of the ability to deal with it. Sometimes you just can't stop 140 miles an hour. I mean, it's just what it is. So in those cases, by having kind of a new, you know, new cohort of trees, so regeneration beneath those that you're excited about, you know, when you lose that existing forest, there's that resilience for it to recover quickly because you have advanced regeneration of species you're interested in, in, in underneath. And, and actually, uh, before we thought, talked about climate change, there was a lot of work, uh, particularly around the Catskill and Quabbin, uh, the, the, the Boston city watershed. They were really concerned about if there was a major windstorm that affected the, the forest that surround the drinking water supply of Boston. Um, those trees would get killed. There'd be a flush of nutrients because there wouldn't be trees to replace them. And then it would take a while before there was clean, you know, clean water or a while before they had to use as much um, treatment to purify that water. 
So the notion they came up with is by having kind of a diversity of sizes, making sure there's regeneration beneath mature trees, that if all those trees blew over, we already have a new forest there to recover and quickly, quick, quickly kind of respond to that. But in a lot of our areas, including certainly our school for, one of our school forests, we have pine plantations or just old field pine that came in you know, 60, 70, 80 years ago or were planted you know, 80 years ago. Or with this, and, and the idea when you planted those at a high density was that somebody's gonna come in ultimately and thin them and nobody does. And so the mechanical stability of those trees is really low. And so I'm not saying we need to like widespread start thinning forests, for, but, but those were already in a pretty vulnerable state when that wind hit. Um, and so there's ways even to kind of influence that. But now I think it's an opportunity to look at how these forests recover naturally. And to be honest, I mean, there's a lot of, you know, that dead wood is certainly an important structure. It looks like a mess to some people, but to me, I kind of like those messes from an ecological standpoint. So maybe working with those to try to get other species established in those spots um, and, and seeing, using it as an example as to how things change. But we're playing catch up on a lot of those types of stands and it's, it's hard to get, get ahead of those disturbances on the landscape. And we've, yeah, we have similar disturbances now, but we are, yeah. Sarah, kind of expanding on Lily's question, the area that I notice a lot of trees blown down is actually quite boggy, and I'm wondering, American sycamore and red maple, would those be the ideal trees to put in that location? Would they, because what is there is lots of goldenrod and um, uh, black, sorry, blackberries. Yeah, so a couple of things. One, as I mentioned, to not get worried about over overemphasize early seedling response, even the early disturbance response, things take a while sometimes to recover. If there's, I don't know what your deer population is like or moose up here, but that can keep things from recovering. But even that early blackberry phase, um, you know, in five to seven years, you'll be amazed what grows through that and actually becomes forest. But at first, it's like there's no forest coming back. And again, some in this room have even more experience with me than that. It's amazing with, when there's not browse, what can come through that. It's a wetter site that also probably contributed a bit to the, the, the level of wind disturbance you might have had on that because of the, 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 the rooting depth. But, you know, sycamore might be a, a you know, push in it, you know, nor, north. But, I mean, red maple, you know, it seems to like where you put it in the refrigerator, it seems to grow anywhere. But um, that's certainly a species that would do well. And even yellow birch, you know, will do well even on some of those wetter sites. It's not like, not, if, it's, if it's like stagnant, it's not going to be happy, but it can do well kind of in that, that great. You know, it's just a spot that I noticed that when it's a wetter season, it's, it's quite mushy underfoot, but then it dries out. It's not bog like it's, it's just marshy underfoot. And the problem with some of those sites is when you lose that transpiration from the trees, they actually get boggier, right? So you kind of lose, so, so it gets a little bit wetter. So trying to have species that can deal with that, that, that wetter condition then. So if it was white pine that blew over, it might be hard for white pine to get going on that now because it's quite wet, so. Yeah. Um, hi, the So we have 35 species of tree, um, generally we think of kind of in our, our, our forest here, which is, um, sounds like a lot until you, I was just down in Kentucky and Indiana and it's just a different world down there. I mean, they can grow a lot of, and they can grow them big. Um, maybe not want to grow trees anymore after I saw some of the size of the trees. Um, but, you know, in terms of an average uh, northern hardwood stand, you're looking at, you know, six to seven trees over and over again, you obviously, you know, American beech, yellow birch, sugar maple, red maple, um, red spruce, balsam fir, you know, white ash, so kind of, you know, eastern hemlock. With some disturbance, get aspen, paper birch, uh, as well as, you know, depending on kind of history of that site, you can have a couple species of aspen in there. So, you know, white pine, red oak. So, but we don't have, like, the tremendous, we, we're quite mixed compared to some places. Again, when I come back from the southwest, I thought, gosh, you know, number one, I'm so happy to be back in humidity, which is strange to think of, but I'm also so glad that it's, not just ponderosa pine everywhere. Talk about a vulnerable forest. I mean, it's one species and, and very much on the edge of, of, of kind of what can support forests. So we have tremendous diversity in our systems. Even within our state, we have tremendous diversity climatically where, you know, in my backyard, I have bitternut hickory. I'm, I'm not on the lake. I'm, I'm, you know, about 20 miles in. So we kind of have our banana belt with the Champlain Valley and then, you know, southern Vermont. So there's a lot of diversity um, in, in those regions, even things like swamp white oak, bur oak. But if I were to take a hike up and over Camel's Hump or up and over, you know, through the notch, I'm probably looking at 10 to 15 tree species that day, um, you know, on average through that, through that landscape. But, on, but generally, it's, it's, it's probably seven or eight that are really dominant in any given area. And, 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 and yeah, many, many adapted to kind of mesic, moist conditions and a lot of plasticity in some of those species. You know, red maple from Florida all the way to Quebec. I mean, pretty, pretty amazing where that species grow. Hi, I'm Kara. Sure. So what 
are all the things that you can tell from foreign trees, and those foreign trees hurt the trees? Yeah, so uh, I'll go with the first one, the second one first. So, so does taking an increment core hurt a tree? So the, the, if I said yes, I'm going to get a lot of stones at me. No, it does not. Uh, so the, the way to think about uh, increment core, so that tree, you know, even, even a tree this large, really the only living part of that tree in terms of its bowl is about an outer, outer sheath of wood about this thick, right? So it's kind of a sheath of cambium across that tree. So what I'm doing is taking literally like a pencil eraser diameter, like punch out of that. So if it's a healthy tree, it's, it's, it's what they deal with on a daily basis in terms of branches breaking, beetles infect, and trying to infest them and so forth. So they're able to kind of naturally heal that over. If it was a tree that was extremely, extremely compromised, it would be just like a very sick person getting a paper cut, and that was the end of them for, you know, they couldn't fit, you know. But, so you don't want to core like a tree that's on its last, like it's got maybe one sprig of foliage left, and you know, that might be hard for it to heal up. But most trees, it's, it's kind of an average thing that happens to them all the time. So don't plug the hole, because the tree actually naturally deals with holes being punched into it all the time. So they'll, they'll pitch it out with pitch, or they'll kind of compartmentalize it. So, um, and don't put the wood back in, because then they're just, it's like a petri dish for, uh, fungi to colonize and, 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 and inhabit. So the reason why we know that we don't hurt trees because it's, it's awesome coring trees, both, both, both in terms of stress release, but you can get a lot from an increment core. So my main interest in coring trees generally is to understand the history of that forest. So both the age of the tree, so this is a, a strip a clear cut on, on Groton State Forest. So this red spruce here, um, if I come back in, in 30 years and it's still alive and I core it, I'm going to see 30 years ago something happened. This tree just started growing really fast. And so because everything else around it was, was harvested. So I can learn a little bit about the history of disturbance. And so we use that history a lot to tell us like, what were the natural disturbance regimes for Vermont? Like how often did they happen um, and so forth. It also can tell me if that tree is you know, 109 years old, I know that in 1910 there was some sort of big disturbance possibly or, or at least some disturbance that allowed it to begin its life. So even knowing the age of that tree, you can tell me a bit about that forest. and then. I can start looking at the individual ring widths and understand what's the relationship between the width of those rings and past climate and get a handle on like what matters most to the growth of that spruce. Is it you know, June precipitation? Is it kind of snow depth? And it really can tell me a bit about like what is it that really drives the growth of that species. Some folks will analyze even the, the carbon isotopic signature, the, the amount of like heavy metals in the, the rings over time to try to understand just like pollution levels, um, the efficiency of the, um, like how CO2 enrichment is affected how they fix carbon. So a lot can come out of a tree ring. Um, it's fun and easy to core them. It's the after the fact part that takes a lot of time, like you know, processing them. There's a lot of things that affect why that tree puts on a fat ring or a narrow ring. So trying to understand like why did this, they unfortunately can't talk, they're awesome, but that's the one thing. Um, so try, that's the closest they can do to talking is giving us those patterns in their rings. And so they're really fun. And if you like history, um, it's just an added layer to the history of that forest that we like to collect from. But if I was interested in veneer out of that not this tree, but maybe a, a sugar maple, um, I might not want to core all the trees out there because it can introduce stain and other things that could, could affect the quality of the tree. So it will often core as low as possible to, to minimize the impact on the, like the, the butt log. Okay. Uh, great presentation. Thanks. Thanks. Always learn stuff. Yeah. Field foresters can't do their job unless you're doing what you're doing with research and technology transfer. So thank you. Yeah, no problem. Uh, the, the, uh, Experiment out in uh, the Dartmouth Grant. I have one concern on it with the room, not knowing the full breadth of education and, and experience in the room, was that you sent a message by the planning experiments that planning might be necessary. It's one of the biggest fallacies out there when we deal with the public and landowners as well, well, you're going to replant the forest when, as you know, yeah. most of our forestry is natural regeneration that's highly successful. Yeah. You also mentioned the deer problem, but other than deer. Yeah, and I'll, and I'll go back to the, so when I, get uh, you busy looking at slides, oh, too much to go back through. Um, all right, so when uh, I was at the University of Minnesota for seven years before uh, moving to Vermont, uh, and I was involved with the installation on the Chippewa National Forest, which is, in, which is in Red Pine. And if you look at some of those locations, we have the Flathead up in Montana, San Juan in Colorado, Jones. These are all pine dominated systems where they're fire dependent and they can shift pretty quickly. They're also parts of the world where planting occurs a lot. And I felt very strongly about putting one in our forest where there's a lot of inertia and where we rely heavily on natural. We are so spoiled traditionally to get back what we want for free um, and often in, in, in spades. And so um, one of the main reasons why I really wanted it in Northern Hardwoods was that we want to show that 
it's not that easy to push this system because it already responds quite positively to management um, in terms of the regeneration we get back. And so even though we're planting trees in those, those gaps, there is so much, actually one of them happened to have a big tooth aspen that we cut. Well, you know what that gap looks like now. It's just loaded with aspen, loaded with pinch cherry, loaded with, so there's a lot of species coming back besides what we plant. And so to, to Jonathan's point, um, just from a cultural standpoint, we used to have a state nursery in Vermont that grew seedlings. Anybody know where that, I know a few people. Anybody know what a state nursery in Vermont was? So you're not talking the Nature Conservancy one down in Fulton, Maine, not, not Nature Conservancy, but yeah, that, that's a, still a useful one. The state of Vermont used to, Essex. So the Essex offices, um, nice pile of sand, good place to run a nursery. Uh, state of Maine used to have a nursery. They closed that in 1988. Um, the only New England state that still is an active kind of vibrant nursery is New Hampshire. Um, New York has one as well. So we don't have a lot of places even to buy seedlings, and there's a reason for that because, as Jonathan points out, we don't really need to replant our forest. Um, a lot of the planting early on was because that was what was viewed as good stewardship in the 30s and, and so forth, you know, in the CCC era and before that. So um, a lot of our plantations are an artifact of, of not quite knowing our forest well enough at the time. Uh, so even operationally, if I wanted to plant like 100 acres of forest in Vermont today, I couldn't get enough seedlings to do that, right? So, um, we're not going to plant our way out of this thing, and I think that's often a misconception. And, and, and Jonathan's point, we're very fortunate to work in a part of the gl globe where we don't have to plant typically. There's not that added cost of what we do, um, except when we start having, yeah, a lot of deer, a lot of moose. It can be a real challenge on those sites. Um, and also, even with uh, the loss of ash in some of these areas, there's been some interest in trying to restore other species to wetlands. Um, so there has been some in increased capacity, not sycamore, but other species like swamp white oak. Um, you know, red maple, silver maple, to start growing more of those to try to restore some of these riparian areas on one ash, and actually American elm crossing it with resistant elm. Um, and so there's a lot of work we're involved with doing that as well. But um, yeah, planting is, a, is, is not what we do. Um, and that's why I say we have to kill a lot of seedlings to prove that it's not as simple um, as folks think in terms of this. But there's a lot of thought about that, like, oh, well, let's just plant more oak and we'll be fine. Um, it's hard enough to naturally regenerate oak, you know, let alone um, get, it, get it back planted. So thank you for, for pointing that out. Yeah. How much has our forest been changed by the fact that we've had earthworms move north? Ooh, now we're going to have to be close, close to home. So I've left the land of 10,000, there's actually 13,000 lakes. Um, so there, earthworms I hadn't thought were much of an issue. When I first moved to Minnesota, I went there for, for a bit of grad school too. Like, oh, or worms, you know, the, aren't those the only beneficial introduced organism? And, and then you start going out in the landscape. And so there, you know, the huge uh, angler population, lots of bait for, for decades being thrown in the woods when you're done, you know, what humane thing to do, let your earthworms go in the forest. And uh, as I just was saying, our forests are awesome. You get back what you want naturally. When you get worms to a heavy infestation level, it breaks that system pretty dramatically, especially for sugar maple. And, and it really does concern me. Um, in terms of earthworms in, in, in Vermont, we definitely see it in places, especially where there's rich soils with a history, agricultural history. It's not as widespread as, as other parts of the, of, the, of the kind of northern forest, like, like Wisconsin, Michigan, um, and, and Minnesota. Part of it is uh, they're, they're pH sensitive. So as much as we weren't excited about acid rain, uh, some of our soils are already, they're not basic enough for earthworms. And also, they're just far enough away from any kind of the, in, the invasion. They kind of move through the forest and it's like invasion front. So the Northeast Kingdom, New Hampshire, they're better off because they have the more acidic. They are, and also there's been less kind of historic cultivation. The only danger is you do have a lot of people fishing in that landscape and so educating the public on um, it kills me to do it but I either kind of will, will, will feed sunfish the worms and watch it happen or I'll just throw the worms in the trash it's you know not mine because it smells terrible but um, it's it's inhumane but it's it's actually stopping the spread of a, a, a traumatic dramatic engineer it could totally change the forest it, it's it, you can feel it under your feet once you've been in the woods with worms you, you know when you're in the woods after that with earthworms you just you just can sense it there's just not that duff layer and sugar maple, that's the key to its germination, is that it needs that duff layer. So it's, 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 it's a, yeah, it's, a, it's one that gets me bummed out. Yeah, it's a tough one. But right now in Vermont, what they're seeing is it's, the really bad areas have some linkage to proximity to, you know, heavy agricultural use. Um, so there was, there's been worms there for a long time and, and also good soils that they're able to kind of migrate into. But, um, so yeah, definitely a challenge. One last question. Yeah. Migration and England was the hot spot. What's why? History. Um, two things. 
definitely a history of bringing things here. So the Arnold Arboretum, which was Harvard, is Harvard's Arboretum, um, unfortunately has the distinction of bringing barberry, other species into the U.S. Um, also, uh, gypsy moth, those familiar with that insect, that was introduced in the Brookline um, by somebody who thought it could make silk in the 18, they thought it was a silkworm, and I think it was the 1860s. So we just have a long history of introducing things to this region. And then our shipping ports, so again, we have a lot, especially beginning in the 80s, if you look at kind of the number of non-native invasive species in the U.S., it really started to skyrocket when we started having kind of global, more global trade, more use of large shipping containers. Um, you know, we can inspect and inspect and inspect, but you miss one pallet that has, you know, a wood-boring insect in it, um, and that's, that can be, be introduced. So just having those, those critical shipping ports um, where a lot of lots being introduced is also the issue. But part of it's just we've been, uh, you know, here for a long time bringing species from elsewhere, um, planting stock, all types of things that can introduce them um, to this region. So that, but what we're seeing now is the Western U.S., you know, before it used to be, you know, not a, they, they weren't thinking it was an issue for them. They're starting to pick up, again, because of global trade, a lot more, and um, what there's been a, that review paper by Gary Lovett and others. It's an ecological applications paper. It's a really nice summary of what they're what they're seeing, but um, really does give some pretty high rates. You know, it's like 0.2 new native, uh, new non-native species per year being introduced to these shipping ports. Um, and the one thing that somewhat protects us is our, our cold temperatures. So that thins out a lot of things. Unfortunately, uh, emerald ash borer, you know, it's negative 30. Uh, we don't hit that. That felt, felt like we hit that yesterday, or today, this morning, just because it was the first time I felt eight. Um, but, uh, you know, a lot of places, you know, like, like Florida, there's a lot more risk where anything can grow and do well. We do have a little bit of a cold filter for certain species, but um, many of those wood-boring insects are adapted to, to overwinter in the bark and, and deal with, you know, cold temps that way. So, um, yeah, a lot of concern over what the, what the future brings with, with non-native. And there's a new one, the uh, spotted lanternfly, that's been moving up through Pennsylvania that folks are quite concerned as well. So. I don't know a ton about it other than it really likes uh, apple species, but it's its primary uh, host. It loves Tree of Heaven, Alanthus. So at first I'm like, that's great. You know, it's, it's going after a non-native, but it also will feed on a lot of the um, you know, malice family, you know, things. So it's less of a, people are less concerned at least uh, for mass forest impact, but certainly all the orchards and other, other, other places. It's a beautiful, I mean, a lot of these are beautiful insects, but it's um, pr quite insidious in terms of the, the impact. And right now it's Pennsylvania, I think it's in the parts of New York, but I, I don't believe it's been detected. It, it might, they might have trapped it in Connecticut, but it's not like actually, um, it, have, it doesn't have any populations there. They just detected it in a trap and that's about it so far. So. Thank you very much. Yep, no problem. <laughs>